Hi, this is Exo Connor, and you are listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. Thanks for stopping by this week. In this episode, we are very excited to have with us Mr. Pete Kipley. Now, Pete is an immensely talented producer and songwriter, and he's worked with artists such as Matthew West, Phil Wickham, and Mercy Me. And on a more personal note, Pete has been a huge influence in my life. When I moved here, he was the first producer I ever worked for or with. And so much of what I learned during my time with him has truly helped shape me into who I am now. There is tons of incredible insight throughout this episode, so you're not going to want to miss any of it. We talk about stuff ranging from working with and protecting artists, as well as dealing with the evolving music industry and figuring out or knowing your place in it, as well as how to find the right balance in your life to not only keep you happy, but to keep you inspired and working on things that you love and want to pour yourself into. Before we start this episode, though, we have an announcement. The Full Circle Music Show has been growing rapidly over the past few months, and we recently just had our first month with over 10,000 podcast downloads. Now, secretly, Seth and I have been working on some brand new training videos for you guys, and we figured to celebrate this 10,000 download milestone, we want to make these videos that we've been working on available to you for free. Seth and I each recorded six videos where we reveal our top techniques that we have discovered over time for improving our songwriting and productions. To get access to both sets of these videos, we decided to make it fun, and we wanted to put together a little challenge for all of you. This is something that will require a group effort from the entire Full Circle community. Thousands of people are listening to every episode that we put up, but right now we only have 21 reviews on iTunes. We definitely want to increase that number. The number of reviews a podcast has is a huge factor on how iTunes displays results when someone searches for a podcast. So if we can increase the number of reviews that we have, it should help tons of new people discover the Full Circle Music Show. So for the month of May, we're going to have our first ever group podcast challenge. The challenge is simple. We need to hit 100 reviews of the podcast on iTunes by the end of the month of May. Once we hit 100 reviews, the brand new songwriting and production technique videos are yours for free. So help us out, help your fellow listeners out, and hop over and leave a review. We would absolutely love to hear what all of you think of the show. And again, once we hit 100 reviews, we'll be able to release the brand new technique videos to all of you for free. That's 12 videos as soon as we hit 100 reviews. So before we go any further, maybe hit pause, leave a review real quick, jump back, hit play again. It seriously will just take a few seconds to do so, and you can just get it right over with. And over the coming weeks, we'll also be sharing some of the reviews on the show, so be listening for a possible shout-out from Seth or myself. I mean, it's only 100 reviews, guys. We can do this thing. Okay, let's jump into this episode with Pete Kipley. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Full Circle Music Show. This is X sitting here with my old friend, producer extraordinaire, and songwriter, Pete Kipley. How are you doing, sir? I'm, I'm great. How are you doing, buddy? Man, I'm doing good. It's good to see you again. It's good to have you around these parts. It's been a, been a hot minute. I know, too long. It's good uh, to see you, man. Uh, it's good to see you. So what are you up to right now? What's, what's been going on with you? Man, I'm um, watching a lot of soccer. Yeah, you know, we're thick full. I know you too. <laughs> as yeah, as you should be, you know, enjoying the Champions League season right Number now. Number one priority yeah, right absolutely, now. Absolutely. I mean, you know, some of these get mixed, it can wait. It can, I mean, it's it can Champions wait between League, 145 man. and 345. Champions League is what's happening. And, and I mean, then we've got like eight other leagues going on in the meantime, too. Exactly. You know, it, it all takes precedent. It I all know. takes precedent. So if you don't mind, let's start off with just kind of hearing your story, like from the very beginning of you getting into music to like what brought you to where you are right now. Do you mind yeah, sharing no, that with I'd us? I'd love to. Uh, I think like everybody else, you know, I was in a band and loved music and wanted to try to figure out how to record it. So I went and got a loan for a four track cassette recorder. Yep. My old Tascam Porta. Yeah. <laughs> uh, old Faithful. And figured that out and started recording my friends and making some records with, with my band friends. Yeah. I met these two Jewish guys in Mobile, Alabama that had a jingle house and they needed a music guy. So they gave me a shot and kind of taught me everything I know pretty much all in one flail swoop. <laughs> you know, it's different because when, you, when you're doing a song, well, for me, I'm notorious for taking months and years to do a song, but. When you're doing a commercial spot, you know, you've got you've got a day to get it done. Yeah. You know I mean, written, recorded, mixed, sent out, the whole yeah. thing. Duplicated and everything. I know. So it was kind of, uh, I don't know, like boot camp. Yeah. You know, because you get there in the morning and, and try to write something that the client likes. And if they like it at lunch, then you record it in the afternoon. And if they like it after that, then you stay up all night making quarter-inch tape dubs. 
And then you just get up the next morning and next do it day. again. There it is. So, <laughs> uh, you know, enough hospitals and bread company music beds to last a lifetime, I think. Dude, but, I hear you. I hear you. But about that time, you know, there was a label that was Immobile called Integrity, and they had a bunch of really great worship writers that were there. And they needed demos, and so they would kind of come out after hours, and we'd work on these songs. And the next thing you know, I met some people up here in Nashville, so I decided to take the plunge and see if I could get things going on here. I hear you. So what was the first big things you kind of did here in Nashville? Like, w were there anyone that brought you in specifically to kind of help you get your feet wet here? Man, that's a great question. And the answer is yes, for sure. Th there was a producer named Stephen V. Taylor that hired me to be a programmer mm -hmm. back in the day. So you'd, you'd just sit there with your rig and program beats and tracks, and they would come in and cut vocals and learned a lot doing that. And eventually ran into a guy that convinced me that I could be a producer if I've recorded vocals and yeah. <laughs> got it mixed. And so he sent me this band from Texas Mercy Me. And that was that, you know, they had a small song. I can only imagine, yep. you know, a few people liked, I guess, but, <laughs> and then overnight you're a producer all of a sudden, yeah. you know, even though I, I don't think I was, or maybe even am quite. Yet, but. I don't know about that, man. I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah. So appreciated that kind of crash course and getting it done and figuring out, okay, this is about songs. Yeah. You know, it's about connecting that thing with people. And I think, gosh, that was 2000 and was 2017. And that song is still in the top 10 yeah. on Christian iTunes. It's crazy, it's crazy, man. The staying power of something like that is just incredible. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so it's what, a blessing or it's a curse, you know? Oh, absolutely, man. So what was it like for you then? Like, like you said, literally overnight, song's huge. And then so for you, it's like you've kind of arrived as a producer in a lot of people's eyes. Was it phone just ringing off the hook at that point? Or what was like the transition from just programmer to now like full-fledged producer with a big song behind you? Yeah. Well, again, I mean, that's a great question. I, I think probably in my story, it happened a little too fast. I wish that I had my mind way back then because yeah. you make a lot of mistakes for sure. But, you know, the, the record business was, it was a completely different time back then. There actually was a record business yeah. where now we have like a touring and a streaming business yeah. and who knows what the heck anybody's doing yeah. anymore, which is a great thing for music because it's kind of like the wild west and, and things have a tendency to get a lot better. Yeah, there's no when, business, no set business model anymore. Yeah, it's, like, it's anything can work. And, yeah. You know, back then, gosh, to record a track, I can make two records for what it costs to record one song back then. Yeah. You know, it was just different. You know, you had to get into a studio to cut drums and yeah. vocals and mix and everything else. And, and now you just don't. I mean, I'll, I can cut vocal in a hockey arena locker room or a <laughs> Prevo. Yeah, exactly. You know, and probably would prefer to do so because the... <laughs> The uh, catering will be better. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, man, I think you, it was just like a tornado, you know, just from one record to the next record. I had a manager who was awesome, maybe a little too awesome. You know, I kind of lost track of a few years there until I was violently awakened to how the business works, you know? Yeah. Which at the time, well, again, it was way different than it is now, but it could be brutal on artists back yeah. then. You know, the deals were not in any way equitable unless you just had a big giant success with the exception of a few people that were doing things a little bit different. Yeah. You know, I think, I think in that time I might've lost the forest for the trees because I think music became a job, mm -hmm. which I never had set out for that to ever be. You yeah. know, music was just a passion to me and, and something I loved and was honored to be in and, you know, I came across this band. I just, I thought that, you know, everything was on a level playing field. Yeah. But, you know, when I kind of found out, you know, what their life was like in comparison to mine, yeah. I mean, I sit in a studio, I write a song, I record it and I'm done yeah. in one week. You know, this is something that they're out living with for a year and a half to 17 years. Yeah. What, whatever the story might be. But, you know, unless they, unless they did have a hit, you know, they would really be struggling to make ends meet. And, you know, as you're touring, especially in our genre, it's very different than in the pop world where, you know, you, you got a show at 1030. So you jump off the bus at 1015, you 
just rock it. Yep. You get back on the bus and go, go to bed, you know? Yep. And this, you've got to do interviews and you've got to meet people pretty much all day from the crack of dawn. You yeah. know, you're on some radio station. Yeah. And then you're with the promoter and their family. And, and then the fans are, you know, really interested in meeting you and talking to you a yeah, lot. Absolutely. So where's these kids out? You know, so, I mean, we'll be home on a Friday night watching movies and they're, you know, after they've traveled 700 miles and just busted on stage, all of a sudden you got a 20 year old kid that's a psychologist it didn't quite make sense. Yeah. You know, at the time. So I, I kind of hit a little bit of a reset and decided to kind of do things differently. Yeah. And, you know, so, I, you know, Bart, the singer Mercy Me, had kind of figured out how, from a band's end, how things could work out and things would be equitable and make you still want to do music. Yeah. And so we started a label together and just wanted to sign some of our friends to yeah. it. And we signed a band called The Afters, and and then this special kid, Phil Wickham, really young worship leader yeah. at the time in California that just blew our minds and, and continues to do so to this day. And I also started working with you, and my music got 10 <laughs> times better. Dude, uh, the 100 times. <laughs> That's why they call you X. It's like... X times this, X. and it's a million times better than what you got. Dude, well, no, the, I mean, just being through all of it with you, man, it's like we talk about mentors a lot in this show, and easily you were first mentor I ever had, like first person who really invested back in me Golly. and just showed me a lot of, you know, of, of what you had experienced up to that point, and then just what we experienced together, too. I mean, it's count, like we were recounting before the show even started here some of the amazing stories, which I'm sure might be dove into a little bit later, but it's just crazy to watch how everything has grown, and even especially as the industry changed, but you know, it's so cool, man. And it was, you yeah. know, meeting up with you and just starting to learn. It was just a huge experience. Well, and, you know, thanks for saying that. And I think, you know, the, the funny thing about that is I think I learned more from you than you learned from me, for sure, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the way, I think that's the way it has to work that way. When you get into music or any kind of the arts, you know, yeah. you could be a ballet dancer or a filmmaker or, you know, a sculptor you'll have an apprentice, you know? And the thing is, you know, I think to me, you know, as soon as I think I've got it figured out, will probably be the last project I get to work on. Yeah. You know, you've got to constantly be learning, constantly be figuring out how to make sounds broader, how to make hooks hit harder. Yeah. You know? Yeah, how to evolve um, what, what, you're, what you're doing. I know it. But, uh, man, I, I'm so proud of you, buddy. Oh, dude, well, you thank know? you, man. Feeling is mutual, man. You've, you've accomplished so much. And just to have been a part of it, it's just been... You know, funny thing about X, I have one person in my will to this day outside of my family, and it's still you. <laughs> Hope nothing happens on the way home here. <laughs> Dude, I, I appreciate Like, put that down. What are you doing? Wait, wait, what are you... wait what's happening? What's happening here? <laughs> so kind of after you, you and Bart, you started up this label, and then you brought on the afters and... And Phil Wickham. So did you kind of, you said you saw that as kind of a restart to going back to looking at music and the artists first, rather than like it becoming so much of a job? Absolutely. And I mean, you know, having any kind of a label and it is a job, you know, you're, there's a lot of communication and there's a lot of learning that went on in that. And I'm thankful for it. You know, you know, with Phil, I think we're on our 10th record right now. What a cheapers. That's I think over, that's an over awesome. Ten, I know, that's incredible. Over ten years, and but it's so much more than uh, making a record. You yeah. know, it is true life. It's you know, you see somebody that you really love uh, having an influence, yeah. and so proud of him in particular. Just the way that he carried himself. You know, we're all born with different things. Yeah. You know, and he got a backpack full of talent. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know people don't know how to use that or it might make them, you know, feel like they're special, mm -hmm. you know, Phil and, and, you know, a lot of the artists that we have the opportunity to work with, it just blew me away and continues to blow me away by how just the same he is, you know, the yeah. same kid as, as we met yeah. way back when, you know, really, it, it, I don't know. I think that music in, in a lot of ways is, like a journal of your life, you'll see people grow musically. You'll see people come to a place where they need to, you know, totally hit a reset yeah. and start again. And so it, it's beautiful sometimes to watch 
people's life and music at the same time yeah. and see how one really directly affects the other. Absolutely. I do know. So after a while, you guys, you took a little time on the West Coast, moved out we for did. a little change of scenery, kind of recharged the batteries a little bit. What was it like transitioning from making music here in Nashville, where you'd been for so long, and just kind of uprooting everything and going out to San Diego? Well, I'll start with the negative. The first negative was you had to stay here, <laughs> although I had brought you out as much as I could, and we'd spent a lot of time putting fires out of the console. I remember that. <laughs> and other things. You know, it was great. I mean, it was amazing being out there. It's like a different country. Mm -hmm. But I think... I mean, there are a lot of things in Nashville that are amazing. There's there's nothing wrong with, with Nashville, for sure. But I think sometimes, like anything else, you know, you, you can kind of just get stuck a yeah. little bit in some of the same patterns and behaviors. And being a record producer, as you well know, it's uh, this is not a 40 or 50 hour a week job. I mean, this is, I mean, 80, 100 hour a week job. Yeah. A lot of weeks, you know, still recovering from all nighters, you know. And, yeah you still, you've got a wife and you've got kids and they're more important, you know? So that's what that was about was kind of figuring out, okay, man, my music got a lot better. The less I worked, mm -hmm. which is funny. I mean, still, you know, still working too much. Yeah. But you know, when all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, you know, there's gotta be a balance here. It pays off in the end, you know, I think, but I loved it out there. And, you know, I think it, it exposes you to different kind of culture, different, I mean, all of a sudden, I mean, in our neighborhood, I think 20 families in our neighborhood, there were only two or three families that were, you know, white families. Yeah. And everybody else is such a great melting pot. Yeah. Obviously, very heavy Mexican community there mm -hmm. because it's San Diego. And yeah. you learn and you can pull things from just great qualities from other people's cultures. You know, you know, there's a lot of biochem, a lot of technology out there. So you've got a lot of people coming in from Asia or India mm -hmm. and even learning about their religion and talking about their religion and what our beliefs are yeah. peacefully and, and just kind of understanding why people believe what they believe. What, I mean, it, it's tough to get that in the Bible belt, you know? Yeah. So it was a great experience for me and Karen and, and our kiddos, I think, and learned how to surf and <laughs> play a little tennis. And hey man, and I know you're a, a huge tennis, a, a huge tennis enthusiast. I've, I know I've watched countless tournaments with you. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, I do I do love tennis. Soccer has kind of come in all of a sudden, yeah. or maybe not all of a sudden, but... Um, it's been growing. I mean, golly. Well, it's nice to have an outlet that's not, you know, necessarily music or something creative, exactly. something that you can just kind of like, okay, I need to decompress. I need to do something else, expend some kind of energy or just look at something else for a little while. Let me ask you this question. Ask it. How much easier is it to work on a kick and track when you've got your team on the screen, even if oh. it's on mute. Oh, it, I, as opposed to uh, nothing. Yeah, <laughs> I stream something all the time. Like it's it's always happening. You stream King. Oh yeah, yeah. Seriously, these guys know I had to do serious things with my data usage because <laughs> I was hit. Like not a lot of people knew there was a data cap on the internet usage here, and I was hitting it within days of the first of the month. I was paying crazy fees, so I had to change my service around. But. That's beside the point. I seriously stream That's all the time. Like somebody and else's phone. Oh, hey, yeah. Let me see your phone for a second. Well, I feel like there's just an intensity. Like I'm a Manchester City supporter and when I'm watching them play, there's definitely like, it's just, I, I'm just in a different headspace in a different zone. And it, it's, yeah, it's great. I love doing it. Man, me too. And, you know, I've really gotten into, you know, with my kids, I, I think I spend more time on a field, you know, <laughs> than I do in the studio. Probably. I don't know. It's, it's, it adds so much. Yeah. It is such a different thing. And soccer too, it's, it, I mean, I think it's made the world so much smaller because, you know, all of a sudden, you know, your kids are on Google earth walking the streets of Barcelona or walking the mm -hmm. streets of Milan or walking the streets of London because their favorite football team, well, they call it football there, yeah. is playing and, and they want to, you know, they want to learn everything they can. And these kids, you know, when you're a professional footballer like that, got to know five languages because you don't know if your coach is going to be German, Italian, French, yeah. I mean, you might have an Iraqi coach, you know, any, you've got to learn these languages. And so you're dealing with, you know, smart kids and it's inspiring our kids to uh, not just be good at a sport, but, you know, wow, I want to learn about a culture. I want to learn about their food and their language and you just can't beat it. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of like you were saying, you said now that you spend a lot more time with your kids on the field and stuff like that. So do you, do you find it like, 
as time in the studio is getting more balanced with your family life and stuff like that, is it working less or is it just working smarter and more like productively when you are working? Like what, what's the shift in the balance been like for you? Great question. I mean, as you know, from, from us having years together, there was, I mean, there was a lot of foosball. I mean, nobody yeah. could beat us. And <laughs> we were very States, good at foosball. Very good. The best, I think. Yeah. Still reigning champions. Yeah. As, as far as I'm concerned. I know. <laughs> Unchallenged. Undefeated, except for the one match that counted. Exactly. You know, which that was rigged. That was um, rigged. I mean, there's ping pong, there's a basketball hoop, there's a football, there's something, you know. Yeah. So now it's like, yeah, these are work hours. It's, we're hitting it. Yeah. We're, we're going to go to work. And I mean, it, it always, it spreads out, obviously, during the day. You might start at 10 and just go to five, mm -hmm. do the soccer family thing, and then come back in, you know, yeah. at 10 and work till one or two and yeah. close things up while it's quiet and do that. But I, you know, I, I think, you know, in, in the today's music climate, I think guys like you and Seth and, and this whole crew here and me and others were busier than ever because we're, we're taking on a different kind of a role. Yeah. It's not just being a music producer and, and being handed something and then handing it back. You know, it's instead, it's like casting a vision, mm -hmm. finding people that you believe in yeah. and making their music impactful and standing beside them and, and then seeing the whole thing through to where you know, it used to be, it's like, okay, you know, somebody for three months or six months, it's like, see you later. Yeah. You may never see him again. You know, to me, music was just a little too important to not let it be a thing where I, you know, I like it to be a long-term relationship. Yeah. Invest you know? back into somebody. And, yeah. Yeah. And help it, yeah. help them know? see their visions. And the, the beautiful thing about the kind of music that we do, you know, it's our success in my mind isn't based on sales. You know, it's going to sell. It's not going to sell. It's going to do whatever it does. That's it's out of my range of influence, but mm -hmm. still it's, it's like working with people that have got that certain way of saying something that a lot of people need to hear mm -hmm. that inspires me. Yeah. I want to be a part of it. You know, I want to be in it and more than anything, I want to protect it Yeah, because you know, when it, when an artist becomes a product, I'm concerned, yeah. you know, this, that's like my kid becoming a product. It's not a product. Yeah. It's, this is a precious person. <laughs> you know? Same thing with worship leaders or, or artists, you know, they need to be protected as much as they need to be produced, you know? Absolutely. So I kind of enjoy spending my time plotting those things. <laughs> plotting some protection. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned earlier with Phil Wickham, you guys, you're on like 10 plus years with Phil. What's it been like forming that kind of bond with him over this period of time and like watching him grow and helping evolve with him, like helping him grow as an artist and as a person. What, what's that been like on that journey? Man, that's a great question. You know, since you were there right at the start, you know, at first it's almost like deer in the headlights. It's yeah. like, okay, wait a minute. This dude is far better an artist than I am a producer. I mean, in, in my opinion, just hearing like the music that was coming out of him, his voice, just the way he held him. So he's a superstar. Yeah. I mean, he, he couldn't walk into a Starbucks or a, a Napa auto parts without everybody going, Hey, who's that? Who is that? You know, he's a star. And, you know, I think, I think you start by saying, okay, you know, what we do, what you and I do, this is a service oriented business. We're Absolutely. here to serve. We're here to serve an artist. We're here to serve a song. It's not about us. Not like we're, I mean, I know there are some celebrity producers. That sounds boring to me and it has a shelf life. <laughs> Where the other, you know, it's like, hey, you know, if, if you can find, you know, someone you believe in and then, and then build that uh, relationship that's built on trust, man, the music, because of the doors of honesty that fling open wide, when somebody can tell me that they don't like something, I prefer to hear that than them tell me that they do. Yeah. Because then it's like, okay, great. Apple A, delete. Yep. Let's get it right. Yep. Let's figure this out. You know, we're, we're not the be all and <laughs> some kind of like, I don't know, um, music genius thing or, you know, most of the time I'm wrong, you know, and then it's, I think being wrong helps you realize when you are right, because when you have somebody else, you know, that's responding yeah. to a track or to a song the way that you are, then it's clicked and that's it. But I always feel like if anybody, you know, has that look, like their eyes are squinted or they're kind of shaking their head, it's just not right. Yeah. And if it's not right, it's not done. It's not right. Yeah. You know, there's, there isn't, you know, sometimes your mind can play tricks on you and make you think, wait a minute, I don't really love it, but you know, maybe everybody else does. Yeah. Wrong. You know, if you don't love it, go get eight hours of sleep, wake up, ask yourself the same question. Mm -hmm. Answer's still going to be no. Apple, a delete. Yep. Start over. Let's get it right. You know? 
Dude, absolutely, man. And with a guy, you know, with, with talents like Phil and with a lot of the other artists you've worked with, I mean, what's it like ha- their voice into the process as well? Because you're, you're not just dealing with how it's striking you. It's also with how it's striking them and stuff as you guys are building these songs. Yeah, well, I mean, I think as, you know, I started making more and more records, like I said, when I started with Mercy Me, I had no idea what I was doing. And I thought, you know, okay, well, I have to be right. You know, I'm a producer. Yeah. I didn't realize that we don't have to be right. It's better when we're not, you know? And the thing is, is that when you are dealing with an artist, uh, you know, that is like somebody like Phil, who, man, these guys, you know, they already know how it needs to sound. Yeah. You know, they've written this song. They know how that, you know, a lot of times they've played it live, you know? What we need to do is be able to take a picture of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a picture. Now, how can we just make it a little wider and a little brighter and just that, you know, it's, we're not here to reinvent the wheel. You know, I always tell people, I just want to make great greater. And if I haven't made great greater, then I don't know, just, yeah. need, to, just need to start over and, until we get it yeah. right. You know, yeah. that kind of thing. Absolutely. You know, I think the more that we realize that, that we need to learn, you know, from comments and, and learn how to read people's emotions, you know, I'd say producing is 80% psychology. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, a lot of times you'll have kids that will think that they're not good. And it's like, well, why are you here if you're not good? You know? Yeah. You you're got good. in here somehow. So Yeah. And maybe somebody said one day, wow, you sing flat. Or maybe, maybe it's like, man, you need to learn how to play in time. And maybe it got into their heads. And so sometimes we spend time undoing that and encouraging these kids to, you know, realize they're good. And that sure is a lot better than working with these kids that think they're great and they're not, which, yeah. you know, you and I have yeah, been, been down, down that, that road. Yeah. Um, it's a long, very lonely, harrowing and, and exhausting road. But the other road is better. Yeah. You know, it's, but I just think, you know, if I go back and, and talk to myself, you know, in my 20s or 30s, it would just be, hey, just listen more. Talk yeah. less. Listen more. Learn more. You know, don't stop learning. And I mean, you look at everything. It's, man, we, we didn't, I, I remember when Trejos came out. Yeah. And we went straight to the store and got them. You I, know, when I remember texting that too. was invented. You brought, um, I remember you brought me a box. You're like, you called me and you're like, hey, your phone might be off for a little while. Don't worry about it. And you showed up with a box <laughs> with a Trejo in it that you'd gotten for me. <laughs> oh, those are the days. That little stylus thing. Oh, yeah. Man. Thing. I think I spent more on replacement styluses than I did on phones. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, everything is changing. So here we have, I mean, we're able to, things we're able to do in computers. I mean, it's scary how easy it is to get something cooking quick. Yeah. You know, at the same time, it's like, man, you know, I want to be careful that, you know, sometimes I miss the analog, you know, I miss the the, the care, the, mm-hmm. the attention to getting the performance right, you know? Yeah. Instead of using a computer to fix something, how about use a computer to screw something up? Yeah. Like we did with tape back in the day, yeah. you know, or consoles, you know, the tricks that we could do and just making sure that, Hey, you know, yeah, I want to know, I want to know how to get the sound in my head. Yeah. You know, what's the best way to get there quickly, not too quickly. I think with the rate at which these kids are uh, creating the things that we're using in the studio today, I'm just crazy excited about it, man. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unbelievable what we can do. Absolutely. You know? I mean, the future is definitely bright. I mean, there's stuff coming out every single day that's just, and the way it's made is just insane. Your mind. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, for us back in the day, you know, I mean, all of our sculpting was with external gear, was with hardware, you know, and EQs, I mean, were yeah. extremely expensive. Yeah. Compressors, extremely expensive. So you're dropping 3000 bucks on a, on a mono a single channel compressor. It's yeah. going to change your life. 3000 bucks is like an entire setup now yeah. for somebody. And you'll hear some of these kids, man, I hear some of the stuff that 15 year olds are doing on their computers that uh, makes me want to fill out an application at a gas station. <laughs> it's like, that is the hottest track I think I have ever heard. Like, how old are you? Yeah. 15. Yeah. Cool. And they're like, Hey, well, how could it be better? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> by not asking me, yeah. <laughs> I don't think, I think you just do whatever it is that you're doing there. You know, what, what kind of mic are you using there? It's, I don't know. It's like, oh, I sang it in my iPhone. Is that bad? I'm like, it's bad for me. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the best vocal I've heard in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Not exactly. I was, we were just talking to a guy a little bit ago about that same thing about 
how just honing your skill is often way more important than the gear that you have to execute it with. I think a lot of people, when they're first starting out, they get hung up on, well, I can't make a, a real record because I'm not in a pro studio. Right. I don't have this, I don't have $40,000 worth of a computer with all this gear. You know, they don't, they could be making the hottest track in the world and they seriously have no idea. On the converse, they can also be making the worst track in the world. But a lot of these kids are making insane stuff, but they don't think that they have a chance at actually doing music professionally because they don't have just simple things like really expensive computers. I mean, I know we made killer records in bedrooms and hotel bathrooms and all sorts of stuff, like stuff people played on the radio and sold millions of copies. Like a lot of times people just need to hear that it's okay to like do that kind of stuff. As you're saying, like hearing the kids cut a vocal on a yeah for sure on an Apple you know an iPhone microphone, man. Man, I mean it's crazy. And you look at you know across the board, you know I I, I believe that you know music is something I I never listen to anything that I've done. I can't you know because you, you're too critical. But you know music that's made out there in the real world, like the hottest record today and today, you know you know one record that will outsell our entire genres catalog of the year to date. Yeah is a 17 year old kid from Atlanta that's making records on his iPhone with an iRig. Yeah. And then coming out two channels into, you know, a 72 channel SSL with somebody <laughs> on the other end of it. And everybody's freaking out about this kid. You yeah. know, he's a producer. He calls himself, you know, he says, I'm just making beats, you know, <laughs> man, good for him. Yeah. You know, it's like, again, you know, a, a, a song, if you have to go to school to learn how to do this, I mean, Good luck with the rest of your life. I mean, no offense to you music school things out there. It, it's like, you know, learning how to fall in love with somebody and marry them. Yeah. You don't go to college for that. This yeah. is music. This is, coming, this is a passion from art. You just figure it out. Yeah. You know? Now, that doesn't mean that we can't learn, but if we're taught how to love, mm -hmm. then do we really even love in the first place? Yeah. You know, it's something you just figure out and then you learn how to love better. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's through, about honing your craft. That's it, man. Yeah. It's like, you know, you. I think with music, it, it's, you know, it's that kind of thing that's, you know, it's so intimate and so special. I know you're the same way. Man, if if I'm not feeling, you know, the hairs on my arms sticking straight up when I'm about ready to print a track, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not done. And it's, but it has to have that emotional feel for me to think that it'll have a chance having that same feel with somebody else. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of kids out there uh, writing great songs, you know. But again, it's like, you know, if, if you bring, I like steak. Yeah. You like steak. We yeah. love steak. We eat a lot of steak. You know, the steak, at, before anybody really touches it, is just a piece of meat. Yeah. And maybe that meat is the best meat in the world. Or maybe that meat is terrible. But it's kind of depend on whose hands you put it in, how the end person judges the meat absolutely you know? so i like to get good meat and try not to screw it up <laughs> the, thing, <laughs> the thing dude I, I dude i totally know what you mean there's just yeah it, it's quality product going in but it almost doesn't matter as much as the technique you use to like nurture it to the final product absolutely that's, that's all right and just kind of taking time and caring and you know hey how's your day you know tell me about this and that and you know you get to experience life and that shows in the music you know but it, it's a lot easier to make music with your friends than than to make music just as kind of a job in, in my experience, I think. I, I hear you, man. So kind of circling back for a second. So after your time in California, you came back here. What's it been like now transitioning back into Nashville? Like, has anything changed for you now that you're back? Like just from the West Coast mindset, just the way you do things now, just how you approach things? Is it? Is it weird to come back to where you had been for so long and just kind of had worked, you know, in a certain fashion with certain people for a while and to come back just fresh, rejuvenated and just brand new start? Man, you're really good at this. That's that's like three <laughs> excellent questions in a row. Man, you know, my mindset is still a West Coast mindset. I think it will always be, yeah. you know, once once you've been there, you, you can never escape it, you know? Yeah. I think, you know, and when we came back, I had no idea really what I was going to get myself, you know, into, I mean, I knew I was going to stay the course with, you know, the people that I was making music with, but, you know, I mean, a lot of things changed in the time I was away with Nashville. I mean, you know, Nashville got better, not that it was ever bad, but it's like, you know, Nashville is an amazing city as you know, being a foodie, yeah. you know, the restaurants got better and yeah. I think it's the fastest growing major metropolitan yeah. city in, the, in America, something like that. And man, just some rad, rad, rad people, 
moving out here, but I'd feel like the, the ones that I connected with the most were people that were coming in to kind of disrupt the industry just, just a little bit. And we need to have an industry if, mm -hmm. to, to be able to, you know, hit the masses. You know, you've got to have radio. I'm not stupid. But it's almost like Elon Musk, you know, kind of came in and said, hey, wait, you know, an electric car can work, mm -hmm. but not only can it work, I'm going to make the sickest looking, fastest electric, fastest car ever. Yeah. It disrupted things, a lot of things, because now everybody's making an electric car. Yeah. You know? Reminds me of the song we produced, Who Killed the Electric Yeah, I remember car. that one vividly. A great one. And to me, you know, I mean, I've always maybe kind of been that way, you know, naturally. I think anybody that's a creative is always a little concerned about, you know, how, how do people think? How yeah. do they like this or not? Is this, you know, that whole thing. And until all of a sudden you realize, okay, wait a minute, you know, there's, there's six people in my life that I need to make sure like me yeah. and they all live under the same roof as I do, you know, and I just need to be me and make music the way that I know how to make it and, and be good to people. And so it, it's been good being back and reconnecting with guys like you and, mm -hmm getting to meet guys like Seth, yeah. who's just just blowing my mind. And he's a disruptor. You know, this is a, a guy that comes in and, and uh, I'm not saying this because it's his podcast. That's just a part of the, the whole story. We need to keep trying to change things. If nothing else, for the, for the benefit of the artists that we get to work with, you know. But, you know, we're, we're moving at such a fast rate of information where now, golly, I mean... We, we could literally record a song right now. It'd be the hottest thing in the world. Yeah. And we could drop that thing tonight and have the chance to have a million people hear it yeah. tonight. This is impossible five years ago, yeah. 10 years ago, 20 years, for sure. Yeah. It's like we would make a record. We'd put it on somebody's desk. would sit there for nine months. Yeah. And by then, it's like nobody's really excited about it. But now you've got these DJs or producers, anything that, uh, man, they're pumped about that song because it is fresh. Yeah. That thing just came off the speakers tonight. Yeah. Quick, let's throw this thing up. Let's get people talking about it. Man, that is a really cool thing, you yeah. know? And I think, you know, it used to be, I don't know, how many were there of us really yeah. back when we were doing this together? Not many, yeah. you know? And now, I mean, anybody can produce because you really can go yeah. get a laptop and do it and, and do it well, Yeah, you know? I think for some people that might have been the end. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's like, wait a minute this is actually helping me because uh, number one, I've got to get even better and even better if I'm even any good at all to begin with, you know? Absolutely. It's got to stay fresh, you know? And I'm inspired by what other people do. I think, I think that's a, a part of where we're at today in music where, man, it's not about capturing the song and then we're finished. Yeah. We capture the song and we're just beginning. Yeah. And I say, okay, let's communicate this thing. How do we do it? You know, and I think there are going to be people that, you know, fit into, you know, the label kind of mold mm -hmm. where that works for them. And that's great, you know? And then I think there are people where it's like, wait a minute, you know, I, I don't, I want to do it my way. Yeah. I want to do it this, this way. I don't want to have somebody tell me, ah, I don't know about that song or we need to have somebody else, you know, write you a song or something like that. You know? Yeah. And I tend to lean more on that side of the dial. I think, you know, I, I don't want to tell somebody what to say. I just want to turn it up, make sure maybe some more people can hear it. Yeah, absolutely, man. At the end of the day, I know we talk a lot about producing is just, you know, really helping people get their message heard. You know, just like yeah. it's all about the song at the end of the day. It's not about anything else. It's like just nurturing that something special that is what someone has to say and just helping people deliver it, you know. And it's what you're saying about being able to just leave stuff fresh. It is a huge thing in the industry now. I mean, Spotify playlists are like the new radio thing. And as soon as you can get something onto a playlist, it's like you, you run the chance of major exposure with it. As soon as right. you can get, you know, front page on iTunes or anything like that, there's all these new things that make radio not less significant, but just maybe not as crucial as it once was. And literally, Kit, we, we did a song with Matt Hammett to where literally he wanted to do, he had this message he wanted to send out before the inauguration or whatever. And within two days, we were able to like produce a song, mix a song, and literally get it out, lyric video, everything. And it's literally just fresh, right out the door, mm. just done. Yeah, that's the beauty of, of today, you know? Just being able to, I mean, to hit so many more people than we could, you mm -hmm. know, before. I mean, my goodness, we, we literally did have to hit radio yeah. for anybody to know. And 
man, now I think there's something like 48 hours of recorded music being put out on YouTube every hour. Oh, and it'll wow. be impossible for us to hear it all, you know, but because people talk and, and people are affected, that's when you see the, the things kind of rise to the top, you know, the, those little bubble moments. And I mean, for us, you know, we used to go out and buy records or yeah. tapes or CDs and, and I mean, I, that would last us six months. Yeah. Now, I mean, there are songs that kind of last us one day, Yeah. you know, but it does that one thing that nothing else in this world can do because somebody said something that you couldn't quite put words to. You couldn't figure out how to say it. Yeah. And somebody else could, and they did in such a way that was intoxicating to you. And it could make uh, a change in, in your life, you know, in the way that you treat others and maybe the way you treat yourself. Absolutely. And I, I think one of the coolest things about how much diversity there is now is, you know, when you're just trying to get inspired, there's so many options in finding inspiration now. It doesn't even have to be in music hmm, alone. Right. You know, it's like I've, I watch food documentaries and get inspired, like to make music just by how crea someone is expressing, you know, their creativity. Even watching, you know, like we talked about soccer or football players, like watching how they express themselves creatively, just even playing a game. Hmm. But now, you know, as we're making records and people want to, you know, want to find references or like inspiration in other songs. There's such a wide well to draw from. Like they'll, I have people reference songs that I've never even heard of, but I pull it up and it's like, why have I never heard of this? Yeah, it's mind blowing. Yeah, it's incredible. And it's like, you know, and you see, and it's like, it's got 65 million plays or whatever. And I, I work in music and it's like, how have I never even heard of this? Like, but it's reached that many other people. It, it's just incredible the times that we're living in. Yeah, it's it's mind blowing and it's so fun to be in it. Yeah. You know, right now. Man, absolutely. Dude, it's great sitting down to chat with Buddy, you. Buddy, thanks catching for up. having me out. Dude, you know, it absolutely. is great to catch up with you. I'm so proud of you. Dude, I'm, man, well, I'm, I'm proud to have you in here, man. Thanks, man. So, one question we try to ask everybody, like, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, but like, you know, you've been a huge mentor to me. For people coming into the music industry, like right now, what what is. What is some advice you would give them, whether they're wanting to get in like production, songwriting, anything mm -hmm. like that? What, what is a piece of advice like you wish you knew? You kind of touched on what you wish you knew when you were younger. Sure. But for someone fresh right now wanting to get into music, like what 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 advice would you offer them? Well, I mean, let, let me start with some advice that was offered to me. I, you know, I wanted to be a doctor when I was when I from the time I was a kid. You know, I was fascinated with medicine. I think it's because. I was kind of a little sick when I was a kid and wanted to figure out how to fix myself. So I'd go out and play with my buddies, you know? Yeah. And I mean, that carried me all the way through to my junior year in high school. And, and what I did since I was 11, you know, I volunteered at Irving Community Hospital. You know, it was like a, one of those pinstripe people. Yeah. But instead of delivering flowers and candy, it was sutures because I could run faster than the elevators could move. <laughs> so if somebody needed a suture in this operating room, there it was. And I did have a mentor there at the hospital too that saw something in me that maybe I would have the potential to do this. The problem was I didn't really like to study. I didn't really get good grades, you know, which that's going to be an issue for collegiate people. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I come to find out. But he took me to this keynote speech at the University of Dallas. So a, a professor from John Hopkins University gave a speech on something I have no metabolic shish kabalash kabalash. I don't know what, what's going on there, but I was still fascinated and mm -hmm. trying to take notes and. And so I got to meet him afterwards. Again, I was 17 and I told him what I wanted to do. And he said, well, let me, let me ask you a few questions. Since I was 17, didn't realize how important this was going to be in the rest of my life. I yeah. didn't remember what those questions were, unfortunately, because what he told me after I answered the questions that had nothing to do with medicine or studying or my grades, he looked me straight in the eye and said, Hey, listen, save yourself 15 years and hundreds of thousands of dollars and go figure out what you're really supposed to do because medicine is not it. And of course, my initial reaction to that was, you know, that eye burst of tears, like yeah. I'm going to show you, I remember getting on my diamond back, <laughs> riding seven miles back down Northgate Boulevard, <laughs> thinking of how, how I was going to pretty much take his job over if he was still around in 15 years. And, you know, woke up the next day, woke up the next day, woke up the next day. And every day got a little bit further away from the idea of being a doctor and a little bit closer to picking up a guitar and kind of figuring that thing out. Yeah. And if I could go back to that guy and find him, I would kiss him on the forehead and uh, take him to a nice steak dinner because he did save me 15 years of my life and 
that much money. I think all that to say, there are some people that, you know, this thing, it sure seems glamorous and nice, you know. This is a job, service, and, and you know, it's nothing. I don't understand why we get trophies for what we do. The people that deserve, deserve trophies are the AC guy that comes out at 2 in the morning when it's 106 <laughs> degrees in your house yeah. and your AC breaks and your kids are sweaty. You know, that gets give that guy an award. Not us, but... You know, if you do feel like this is what you're supposed to do and you're young, this is what I would do. I would go to college and I would get an econ degree straight away. Just do it. You know, make beats at night. Figure it out. Figure out how plugins talk to each other. Do we EQ before we compress or after or both? The same thing. Figure out how to write a song mm -hmm. while at the same time you're getting an econ degree. And that's, that's short for economics. <laughs> the economics of life. Because here's what's going to happen. One day you might have a hit. And if you do, you're going to have money and not really know how to do it if you don't have an economics degree. All that money is going to go and buying some new car that you don't really need in 15 years, you know. <laughs> but also, you know, I think like anything, like, you know, look at the great athletes. You know, they're going to be great for 10 or 15 years. And then there's going to be greater, you know. It's going to be time to do something else. Not always the same in, in what we do as that, but for a lot of people it is. Yeah. It doesn't even need to be something, a next chapter. But at that point, all of a sudden you have a wife and four kids and a dog and a mortgage and a couple cars where when you're sitting down and become a producer, you don't have any of those responsibilities, yeah. you know? So, you know, that's, that's the beginning thing I would do. You know, next, find somebody whose music you just love, give them a call and see if you can come and sit down and just be a fly on the wall and go bring them some coffee and hang out and you might be surprised. You know, you might end up staying there for a while and learning a few things. And you might end up staying for a while and teaching that person a few things. But, you know, I would just encourage everybody to uh, follow that thing. You know, keep your heart in the right place. You know, love people. This is not about us. It's about everybody else, you know. And have a great time making good music. That's awesome, man. Pete Kipley, thank you thank so you, much, X. buddy. Thank it's you. It's been absolutely great. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Hi, this is X O'Connor, and you've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This episode is produced by the Full Circle Music Company with editing help from Jericho Scroggins and Jordan Salamoni. Now, there's some big changes happening in the world of Full Circle Music, so to keep up with all things Full Circle Music, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Full Circle Music Co. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode.